Hi all. In this video, we're going to see about erythropoiesis. So this question has been asked in many university exams as either as a answer briefly question or even as a diagram question. So the steps of erythropoiesis with diagram is a favorite. So uh, we have to know, understand how to draw them very thoroughly. Another question that can be asked from this area is the factors affecting erythropoiesis, which we'll see in another video. So on this note, we'll see how to approach this question for an exam. So initially, we'll start with the definition of erythropoiesis. What is meant by erythropoiesis? In simple terms, it is the process of formation of erythrocytes. Next, we'll see the different stages of erythropoiesis. So we know that erythropoiesis occurs even during the fetal time, even in the intrauterine lifetime itself, that is erythropoiesis. So this erythropoiesis can be divided into three stages. First is a mesoblastic stage, then we've got the hepatic stage, and then we've got the medullary stage. So erythropoiesis in an individual basically occurs in three stages, mesoblastic, hepatic, and medullary. So the first one is the mesoblastic stage. So this occurs in the early intrauterine life, and the site of erythropoiesis is the yolk sac, the mesoderm of yolk sac. So to uh, show this concept, you can draw a graph with the months of intrauterine life on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, we can have the hematopoietic activity. So as I said, in the early intrauterine life, there is a yolk sac, which is the site of erythropoiesis. So you can draw a graph like this, which shows a peak at around one month. Okay. Now next is the hepatic stage and this occurs from the fifth week of gestation onwards. So hepatic stage just like the name suggests the erythropoiesis occur in the liver and spleen. So if you are going to depict that in this graph it will be something like this. So you can see that from around uh, fifth week of gestation to around the late tri uh, third trimester the liver and spleen is a site of erythropoiesis. Now after the hepat uh, hepatic stage we have got the medullary stage. So it's generally from the fifth month of intrauterine life onwards that bone marrow will become the site of erythropoiesis. And as you can see, the, site, the production of erythrocytes from the bone marrow increases and even after birth, it is the bone marrow which is the site of erythropoiesis. So initially, as I said before, initially it is slow during the second trimester, but from in the third trimester, it will become more effective. And after birth, bone marrow is the sole site of erythropoiesis. So if there are any other uh, sites of erythropoiesis other than the medullary erythropoiesis, then it is considered as abnormal. That is why we say that extra medullary erythropoiesis postnatally is abnormal. Extra medullary means from other sites like liver and spleen. Okay. So now from when we say medullary erythropoiesis, which all bones will be involved? So initially in infancy up to adolescence, the marrow cavity of all bones will be involved, including the limb bones. But after adolescence, erythropoiesis in the limb bones will decrease or it regresses. So after the age of around 20 to 30, the erythropoiesis primarily occurs in bones like sternum, ribs, vertebrae, skull, pelvic and pectoral girdle. So as you can see, it is mainly the flat bones that is involved in erythropoiesis. So you can draw this, uh, depict this concept with the help of a graph again, which has age in years on the x-axis and on the y-axis you have cellularity in percentage. So as I said, initially the limb bones will also be involved. So you have tibia and femur which is involved in erythropoiesis, but that is only up to adolescence. So from around 20 to 30 years of age, it is the other flat bones such as rib, sternum and vertebrae which is involved in erythropoiesis. So this graph depicts which all bones are involved in erythropoiesis. Okay. So now we will move on to stages of or steps of erythropoiesis. So before knowing the individual steps of erythropoiesis, we have to know about hemopoiesis in general. Hemopoiesis means it includes not only RBCs, but also all other cellular components of the blood, like WBCs, that is the granulocytes, the granulocytes, and also the thrombocytes. How are they produced? So the basic stem of development of all the cells inside the blood is, initially there will be some stem cells, which will differentiate to form progenitor cells, which will further differentiate to form precursor cells and finally you will have the mature cells. 
so this picture beautifully uh, depicts this concept so initially as you can see you have the stem cells the pluripotent stem cell and all which further differentiate to form the myeloid and the lymphoid stem cell it is from the lymphoid stem cell that we have the lymphocytes and from the myeloid stem cell we have all other groups of cells present in the blood now these cells here for after the myeloid stem cell we've got a certain group of cells which are called the progenitor cells that means they have committed to produce some a specific cell line okay so these are the progenitor cells so each cell have got a group of progenitor cells which further differentiate to form the precursor cells and they finally form the mature cell so remember there will be stem cell progenitor cell precursor cell and mature cell for all cell lines present in the blood okay so on this note we'll see the steps of erythropoiesis so the stem cells of erythropoiesis are the pluripotent stem cells now pluripotent stem cells are the stem cells for all cells present in the blood now the importance or the characteristic feature of pluripotent stem cells are they have the ability of self renewal that means they can divide themselves and produce more pluripotent stem cells not only that they also have the property of differentiation which means they can differentiate to form committed stem cells so the committed stem cells as far as blood is concerned or uh, hemopoiesis is concerned it is the myeloid stem cell and the lymphoid stem cell as i said before it is a lymphoid stem cell that produces the lymphocytes but it is a myeloid stem cell which produce all other cells present in the blood including the rbc clear so stem cells as far as erythropoiesis is concerned we can have pluripotent stem cell and committed stem cell which are the myeloid on the lymphoid so the stem cells differentiate to form the progenitor cells so progenitor cells means they are more differentiated than the stem cells and another important characteristic of progenitor cells is that their self renewal capability is less when compared to the stem cells so which means they've got more differentiation but lesser self renewal and another important feature of progenitor cells is that they form clones of cell with the help of growth factors so that is why they are also called colony forming unit because they form clones of cells they are also called colony forming unit or cfu colony forming unit so these uh, progenitor cells can be multipotent or unipotent so one example of multipotent is cfu gemm so cfu means colony forming unit gemm means granulocyte erythroid megakaryocyte macrophage which means this one progenitor cell which developed from a stem cell can develop into many stem lines many cell lines okay like granulocytes they can form this one uh, multipotent cell can form granulocytes they can form erythrocytes they can form platelets they can form lymphocyte macrophages so this is a multipotent or just got multiple potency now what about unipotent so there are some unipotent stem cells also or progenitor cells that can produce only a single cell line so example of that is burst forming unit erythrocyte or bfue so this progenitor cell burst forming unit erythrocyte they can only develop into erythrocytes and another one is colony forming unit erythrocyte cfue so the difference between bfue and cfue is that bfue forms large colonies when they are cultured they form large colonies whereas cfue forms smaller colonies so that is the difference between bfue and cfue so the progenitor cells the stem cells are pluripotent stem cell which uh, differentiate to form the committed stem cell then you have the uh, progenitor cells which are more differentiated which is a bfue and cfue so now we'll see about the precursor cells which are the different precursor cells of erythropoiesis so the first cell that has been identified is called the pronormoblast is also called proerythroblast another term is pronormoblast so how does this cell look like so pronormoblast cells are big in size the cell size is around 12 to 20 micrometer the nucleus is large which occupies most of the cell as you can see this is this whole thing is a is a nucleus not only that the chromatin is fine reticular chromatin which means it is not condensed properly and it contains several nucleoli okay now what about the cytoplasm cytoplasm is intensely basophilic due to the high rna content so these are the different features of the pro normoblast so the must know points are that the other term for pro normoblast is pro erythroblast it is a first morphologically recognizable cell 
another point is mitosis is present that means they can divide a lot so mitosis is present that there is rapid proliferation of cells and there is no hemoglobin see when hemoglobin is present the staining of the cell will also be different so at this stage hemoglobin synthesis is not visibly seen so that is about pronomoblast or pro erythroblast next cell is early nomoblast also called basophilic erythroblast so here the cell size is around 14 to 16 as you, as you can see the cell size has decreased a bit the nucleus is large but it is more condensed when compared to our pronomoblast so it is at this stage that condensation of chromatin takes place and another important point is there is no nucleoli in the in the pronomoblast we said there is there is around, around 2 to 3 nucleoli but here there is no nucleoli and what by the cytoplasm cytoplasm is still basophilic okay so important points at this stage are there is active mitosis that means there is rapid proliferation even at this stage and then another important point is that the nucleoli disappears so i am specifying these because this these can be asked as an mcq question also the stage at which nucleoli disappears is a basophilic erythroblast stage like that so now the next stage is the intermediate nomoblast or the polychromatic erythroblast intermediate nomoblast also called polychromatic erythroblast stage so in here the cell size is somewhat more lesser around 10 to 14 micrometer so as you can see the cell size has decreased further the nucleus is more condensed and as you can see it is pushed to the periphery till this time it was central it was uh, having a big huge space but from intermediate nomoblast onwards the nucleus is more condensed and is pushed to the periphery what about the cytoplasm so see it is called polychromatic poly means many and chromatic means color so here at this stage you've got different colors for the cytoplasm so what could be the reason for that because hemoglobin begins to appear so till now it was highly basophilic but when hemoglobin begins to appear there will be a slight acidophilic tinge also so the color of the cytoplasm changes okay now another important so the important points at this stage the intermediate nomoblast stage is that hemoglobin appears and mitosis stops so till now up till the early nomoblast stage there was rapid proliferation of cells but at the intermediate noble nomoblast stage mitosis stops so when hemoglobin comes mitosis stops okay next is the late nomoblast stage also called the orthochromatic erythroblast stage so here the cell size has decreased even further it is just 8 to 10 micrometer the nucleus undergoes a pycnotic degeneration which means the nucleus is having a degeneration is being more pycnotic and what about the cytoplasm at this stage you can say that the hemoglobin amount has increased so there is more it is more acidophilic than basophilic so there will be a mixture of colors there will be a slight diffuse basophilic hue due to the presence of small amount of rna but it will be more acidophilic due to the increased amount of hemoglobin okay so that is about the nucleus site and the cytoplasm and then what happens to the nucleus see after some time what happens is the size of the nucleus decreases further and further and finally it will be extruded out of the cell so that is how the rbcs will have it doesn't have a nucleus so that occurs at this orthochromatic erythroblast stage or the late normoblast stage clear so the important features at this stage are the nucleus is small pycnotic so there is an appearance for this which is called the cart wheel appearance cart wheel appearance so it is finally extruded out of the cell and disappears there is no mitosis so they cannot divide and the hemoglobin increases in amount that is why the cytoplasm is more acidophilic okay and then finally we've got the reticulocyte which is the immediate precursor of erythrocyte so here the cell size is almost similar to rbc it is around 7 to 7.5 micrometer cytoplasm is acidophilic because of the presence of hemoglobin and as you can see there is no nucleus nucleus is absent but what you can see is fine reticulum of the basophilic material in the cytoplasm see we said that there is there is there was always a basophilic hue no at the stage of reticulocyte you just have some rna which is present in the cytoplasm which appears as fine reticulum and this stains with supravital staining called for example like brilliant chrysal blue 
so this rna material or the fine reticulum can be visible only with the help of stains such as brilliant chrysal blue okay so that completes our precursor cells so we have seen about pronomoblast early nomoblast intermediate nomoblast late nomoblast and reticulocyte remember all the initial cells have got different name also pronomoblast is also called pro erythroblast early nomoblast is also called basophilic erythroblast intermediate is called polychromatic erythroblast and late nomoblast is called orthochromatic erythroblast okay and finally we are going to talk about the mature cells so the mature cell is the erythrocyte the size is around 7 to 7.5 micrometer nucleus is absent and the cytoplasm is esterophilic so when you draw the erythrocyte remember to draw the central pallor also so thus that completes the different stages of erythropoiesis so when you uh, so when the steps or uh, the flow chart of erythropoiesis are you can start from the pluripotent stem cells which in turn uh, differentiates to form the committed stem cell or the common myeloid progenitor cell which differentiates to form the burst forming unit erythroid and colony forming unit erythroid which then forms the precursor cells the first one is the pronomoblast which differentiates to form the early nomoblast the intermediate nomoblast and then we've got the late nomoblast which finally forms a reticulocyte which matures to form the erythrocyte so this is the basic flow chart that you have to draw not only that you have to specify the characteristic of each of the cell you have to draw the cell and specify the characteristics so for, so for example for pronomoblast you have to identify or uh, mark as the this is the site base of like cytoplasm the nucleoli the fine chromatin um, etc so all the features of the cell must be well labeled when you draw the diagram for erythropoiesis so thus we have seen the steps of erythropoiesis but now what what are the factors that actually tell the cell to develop into a certain cell type so for that we've got some inducers some growth inducers and differentiation inducers so growth inducers means they cause the growth and reproduction of the different stem cells which means they help in the multiplication of the cells and we've got some differentiation inducers which causes one type of committed stem cell to differentiate into the other so growth inducers means mainly help in multiplication and differentiation inducers mainly help in differentiation so what are the different growth inducers and differentiation inducers in erythropoiesis so the most important growth inducers are interleukin 163 and gmcsf and gcsf what is gmcsf granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor and gcsf is granulocyte colony stimulating factor so these interleukins and colony stimulating factors help in the multiplication of the cell or they are growth inducers and what are, what is the differentiation inducer for erythropoiesis it is of course epo that is erythropoietin so erythropoietin is the most important glycoprotein hormone that is that tells the cell to produce erythrocytes okay so you have to mark that also in the flow chart so finally when steps of erythropoiesis is asked as a diagram or as a short essay question your answer should look something like this initially you can write about the pluripotent stem cell what are the different growth uh, inducers and then the different steps and this is what i said in the for the cell as such you have to mark or label the different characteristic features so as yes, you can see you've got the pronomoblast the early nomoblast show the markings intermediate nomoblast draw the diagram show the markings late nomoblast draw the diagram and the markings especially you have to mark the pycnotic nucleus and cartwheel appearance and for reticular side the fine reticulum okay and thus so that will complete the diagram you can also write the alternate term also so for example if for late nomoblast you can also write it as orthophilic erythroblast so like that you can write the alternate term also for each stage of erythropoiesis so that is how you can write this answer for the exam so i hope this concept is clear thank you